Thank you, Simon, for that uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's nice, particularly nice, to have a parliamentary meeting here in York, the last place, according to my records, where Parliament met outside London was here in York. It depends, of course, whether you're a royalist or a, or, um, um, a parliamentarian, because I think the parliamentarians met at pretty much the same time in Oxford, and the royalist rump of the Parliament met here at the King's Manor, which now, of course, is part of the university. Um, I've been asked to speak about Parliament and Peace, uh, quotes drawing on my experience as president of a NATO parliamentary uh, assembly. Um, and I intend to explore the roles that NATO plays in securing peace and the roles which MPs play in holding governments of NATO countries and indeed NATO itself to account. Uh, I am coming to the end of my two-year mandate as president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, I was elected by its 250 members, MPs from the 28 NATO countries, to uh, lead the uh, Assembly over the last two years. Um, and since it's coming to the end of my mandate, it's a good time to reflect on two years which have deeply changed uh, NATO. Those changes have come about largely as a result of external forces beyond NATO's control. Uh, Russia, for example, adopting a, a more assertive or aggressive foreign and security policy. And the deepening crisis, of course, in Syria and the emergence of the Islamic State uh, as a new Islamist fundamentalist uh, um, terrorist network. Uh, but also, I think NATO has changed, to some extent at least, I think to a lesser extent, but to some extent at least, as a result of pressures from the public uh, and from our parliamentary assembly. Uh, we, for example, have uh, pressed NATO strongly um, to do more to explain to the public in NATO countries uh, what it does and how it does it, what it spends and where that money goes, We've persuaded NATO's Secretary General to publish an annual report. Uh, this is something every government department in the UK does once a year with lots of details about uh, where your money goes and what it's spent on. And we felt that NATO should do something similar. We also have been pressing NATO to publish its accounts. Uh, and it has decided to do so. And the first three sets of accounts publishes perhaps or it uh, has, you know, something like 40 sets of accounts a year for different divisions within NATO. Uh, and the first three sets of accounts from this year have now been audited and placed on the auditors' websites. Uh, we as a parliament tried to persuade NATO to adopt a system for us as MPs to ask parliamentary questions, written questions. Um, but I'm afraid in a formal sense, they said no to that um, they're very open to providing information, non-classified information to us to help us prepare the reports and briefings that we produce for MPs. Uh, but the idea that they should be accountable to uh, a parliamentary assembly in the way that a national government, the executive branch country by country, is held accountable by a national parliament was for them uh, a bridge too far. NATO's line of accountability is to the North Atlantic Council. This is a round table with 28 seats, uh, one for each uh, country of NATO. Normally on the regular uh, Wednesday morning meetings being filled by the ambassador that each country appoints to NATO, but uh, a few times a year it's held at ministerial level, either with defense ministers sitting in those chairs from the 28 countries or foreign ministers uh, or prime ministers and heads of uh, state. Um, why have we been pressing for a greater openness and transparency from NATO? Well, it's because I believe there's a greater public attitude, a public appetite for information. When I first became an MP some 20, 22 years ago, uh, members of the public, my constituents, pretty rarely raised issues of defence and foreign policy with me. There was far more interest in local uh, domestic uh, 
issues. But post-Afghanistan and Iraq, there's been much more appetite from the public to ask what the government is doing and why, and less um, deference to professors of politics and think tank chiefs and ambassadors and ministers and foreign policy experts in London to whom the public, uh, when I was first in Parliament, were much more willing to uh, let pull the levers of foreign policy decision making. Now, it's often said that the first duty of any government is the security of its citizens. Uh, peace and security are two sides of the same coin. Citizens don't have security in time of war. Uh, and security can also be reduced by conflict or civic unrest that uh, falls some way short of war, as we saw during the troubles in Northern Ireland. People on both sides of the Irish Sea were killed and injured as a result of um, the troubles. Uh, people are affected by cybercrime. It's not just when somebody wrecks your computer, uh, but uh, increasingly computer hackers employed by defense ministries and others uh, are influencing the quality of our lives. I don't think at the moment they're killing people, not in large numbers at any rate. Uh, the drugs trade, I mean, there are a variety of threats which uh, are not uh, threats that come because of war, which nevertheless affect the security um, of people in the UK and in other countries like ours. Um, now, generally, governments seek to avoid war um, and to counter a range of non-war, lesser security threats. Um, I've produced a handout, which I hope all of you have, if not, there's some on the back of the chairs. This is a straw-coloured sheet of paper in which I've um, put out a few facts and figures in four tables. And I'd like to ask you to look first at table one. Uh, the first half of the 20th century for Europeans and people in many, many other parts of the war was an age of extreme conflict, as the figures in these tables show. Um, it's very difficult to decide exactly how you're going to measure casualties from a war. In these figures, I've taken, uh, with a small c, fairly conservative measures. Uh, I'm saying, for instance, that 722,000 service men and women, a few women, um, from the UK died during the First World War. Those of you who have noticed the uh, ceramic poppy um, installation outside the Tower of London will know that 888,000 poppies were planted, one for each British military casualty during the war. Why is the figure higher than mine? Well, because that was for every British and empire. Back in time of the First World War, there was no distinction between citizenship between South Africa, New Zealand, Britain and um, I I I Jamaica. So um, the British contingent uh, could be seen as higher uh, than this. The British number of casualties could be seen as higher. Um, and the total casualties on all sides, military casualties, uh, there was somewhere between 8 and 10 million killed over a four or five year period. So during the First World War, something like 100 and 50,000 British, young British service men and women uh, were killed each year during the conflict and something like two million servicemen and women uh, from all the countries involved in the war. If you look at the Second World War, the number of British casualties was rather lower, about 300,000 in total, something like 50,000 a year. The number of casualties, military casualties, in total was considerably higher, 22 million, um, something like three and a half million a year, although these figures are estimates because it's very difficult to determine exactly how many um, Chinese, for example, um, or indeed Russians were killed uh, during the war. 
Um, somebody put down a freedom of information request last year to ask how many British service personnel had been killed in all the conflicts since the Second World War. Uh, and the number from 1948 until 2013 was 7,138, and I've been able to track my further death since the numbers were issued. So I've increased the number to 7,145, which equates to something just over 100, 108 to be precise, um, military casualties a year. So if you compare the number of British military personnel who have been killed on average each year since the Second World War, it's hugely, hugely, hugely lower than during the two world wars, um, 500 times lower than the casualty uh, rate during the Second World War, and 1,500 times less than the casualty rate uh, during the First World War. And none of these figures include civilian casualties. If you were to include civilians, it would at least double. Uh, uh, again, it depends how you measure them. So why do I put forward these, these, these figures? Um, because for all its failings, uh, policy since the Second World War, international foreign policy, has created a more um, benign environment, at least for people coming from Western countries like ours. Uh, both my father and my grandfather were soldiers, respectively, in the Second and First World War. They both lost their um, youth. My father, as a teenager, went off the war and he came back aged 24. Uh, my grandfather, again, lost his youth. Um, and that's not a burden I've had to pick up. Um, I have not been challenged in the same way, and nor have the uh, two, I suppose, subsequent um, generations. So, um, what is the role of Parliament in relation to foreign policy, security and conflict? Um, in a democracy, Parliament should reflect public opinion. MPs are elected to pass laws. It's not something that governments do. In other words, parliaments create the legal framework within which governments have to operate. Governments often complain when they're challenged in the courts, told they're doing something which is illegal uh, through a process called judicial review. Uh, but governments don't set the law. Uh, they uh, have to make proposals to parliament and seek to get parliamentary approval, and parliament often uh, uh, withholds that approval. I remember when Labour was in power, um, Labour Home Secretaries seeking ever greater powers to detain people suspected of terrorism without charging them, so there'd be ample time for <sighs> security officers, spooks and police officers to trawl through computers, translate file after file from foreign languages into English and to see what was there. And Parliament put restrictions on uh, the amount of time that people could be detained. It put restrictions on, it, it uh, declined to give authority for government ministers to de or police officers to determine that people should be uh, detained and said that on each occasion the application from the police would have to go to a court of law. A judge would have to hear whether there was a prima facie case that this person might have been involved in terrorist activity uh, and to consider whether it was reasonable in those circumstances to continue to detain them. And then one week later, the person would have to be brought back to court again. And one week later, again, and each time the judge would have to look at the progress of the police inquiries and decide whether a reasonable case was being made for continued detention. It also served the purpose of enabling somebody other than those detaining the person to check on their well-being. Did they show signs of torture? Did they have burn marks on their face or wrist or back? These are things which uh, Parliament uh, insisted on. Uh, secondly, the role of Parliament is to hold the government to account. The government, of course, has huge powers, uh, often given in previous legislation by Parliament, but it's for the 
parliament to check how the government is using those powers. Um, it's our job to uh, listen to and reflect the views of the people we represent. We can't always agree with everybody on every issue. If you, <sighs> Parliament is taking a decision about the form of the abortion law. There will be people who lobby me for no change to protect a woman's right to choose. There will be people who lobby me for restrictions on abortion, and I can't please them all. But I do have to listen to them all, think about what they're saying, respond in correspondence to the representations they make and to explain the decision uh, that I've come to in Parliament also, of course, acts as a forum for national debate. Now, I believe that MPs generally take these responsibilities uh, extremely seriously. I think that was illustrated, if you like, by the debate we had uh, 50 months ago in August 2013 when the government made a proposition to Parliament that we, as MPs, the House of Commons, should uh, approve uh, military strikes against Syria in response to the use of chemical weapons in the Syrian civil war. Parliament looked at the case which the government was making and took the view for a variety of different reasons, different people voting for different reasons, uh, to withhold that authority. It's the first time in 230 years that Parliament has refused a government um, authority to engage in military action. We're not always asked. Under British law, there's a crown prerogative. The government has the right to engage in military action without consulting Parliament, but uh, um, certainly since Tony Blair took the initiative of making a proposal to Parliament in relation to the uh, Second Gulf War, the second uh, invasion of Iraq, uh, there's been a precedent established that if it's not uh, a matter so pressing that you have to respond immediately. If somebody detects a missile directed at London, you don't wait till you have convened Parliament to decide whether you try and shoot the thing out of the sky before it lands in London. Uh, but uh, in a conflict such as Syria or Iraq or uh, Libya, um, where the time factor is less pressing or critical, I think there is now established a precedent that the Prime Minister of the day should take the issue uh, to Parliament. Um, how does the UK Parliament carry out these duties? Um, first of all, we require parliamentary approval for the existence of a standing army. You might say, well, that's a bit daft. We've had a standing army for decades, maybe for centuries. Uh, but that's only because Parliament, at regular intervals, uh, votes through legislation to permit the government to raise an army. Every five years we have to do it. There's, uh, we've passed legislation, Parliament, to say the government may not, um, in general, uh, raise an army. Because why? Because it's a matter of human rights. It could be used to oppress people in our own country or elsewhere. Um, and the only way in which the army is maintained is if Parliament approves legislation. We pass an uh, Armed Forces Act every five years, and if we were to fail to pass one, the army would have to be disbanded. So there is a regular check. Um, secondly, the government has to come to Parliament to get authority for military spending. It's called the budget process, but without getting authority from Parliament. Um, to expend money on the armed forces. Uh, it doesn't have the money to spend. Um, thirdly, we follow in all NATO countries the doctrine of civilian control of armed forces. Uh, generals command their soldiers, admirals command their sailors, and marshals command their air men and women, but only to undertake tasks for which they've got authority from a civilian supervisor, ultimately the Prime Minister, um, or other ministers, a Minister of Defence, for example, delegated to act on the Prime Minister's uh, behalf. Uh, also, as part of this doctrine, we as members of Parliament can put down as many questions as we like about the conduct of the armed forces, about how they're managed, 
Um, I've recently tabled questions about the humanitarian implications and consequences of the recent decision taken by Parliament to authorise the use of uh, military UK military strike aircraft uh, in Iraq. Um, we can do so by correspondence. I'm involved in a long correspondence with the Armed Forces Minister at the moment about whether the headquarters of a newly established brigade, a command unit uh, commanding uh, between five and 10,000 uh, soldiers, uh, should be based in York or in Catterick. Now, I have a vested interest, of course, as a York MP in keeping the jobs in the command here and briefed by senior military officers, including the guy I'm letting a cat out of a bag, but he's about to leave the army, so I let the cat out of a bag, who currently holds brigade-level uh, post. It's based in York and says it would be much harder to do the job effectively from Catterick because part of the job is liaising with the public about what, what the army is doing, and uh, York is more closely connected with other towns and cities in the north of England. He covers a big patch uh, than is uh, Catterick. Um, then there's also the process of parliamentary scrutiny. Um, the best resourced parliamentary oversight committee is the Public Accounts Committee. It has about 1,500 staff, accountants, economists, um, who carry out audits, uh, fairly routine financial audits of government expenditure, including audits uh, of all military, Ministry of Defence expenditure, and it carries out specialist studies about particular government programmes, and you often see these reported in the press. Why has this cruiser programme, naval warship programme, ended up with warships costing twice what the original estimated price was? Well, it's almost certainly the Public Accounts Committee that's tracked down the detail and proposed to the members of Parliament who sit on the um, committee that they ought to be asking questions uh, not just to point the finger and complain and create headlines for newspapers, but to try to change the procedures that, in this case, the Ministry of Defence, they do similar reports about the Department of Health, the Department of Communities and Local Government, I mean, every government department, uh, to try to make sure that uh, structures are improved so that better value for money uh, is obtained uh, in future. There is also a Defence Select Committee, a team of 13 members of Parliament, um, whose makeup reflects the balance of the parties in the House of Commons, who look, rather than at the accounts, at the policy of the uh, Ministry of Defence and the Armed Forces, um, as does the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, in relation to the foreign policy context within which um, our security forces operate. Uh, and so does my own select committee, the International Development Committee, in relation to uh, UK aid spending, and in most places where there's a UK military presence, um, under um, uh, a, 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 a doctrine usually called the comprehensive approach, there is both a diplomatic element, a political element, if you like, of the response to a crisis, uh, an armed forces or defence element, and a development cooperation element. In Afghanistan, for instance, the UK is both arguing with the government of Afghanistan to improve its governance, to seek to resolve differences with those who are insurgents, who are fighting a civil war against the uh, government of Afghanistan, uh, as well as in the past, uh, providing security, acting under a UN mandate to keep the peace or seek to keep the peace in Afghanistan. Uh, and at the same time, our Department for International Development has been sinking wells to provide clean water for farmers, for them and their livestock, uh, to uh, provide schools for girls to go to school, uh, to improve healthcare services and so on, in the belief that a better provided for society, a better quality of life, better livelihoods for citizens in Afghanistan would make them more likely to find political solutions to the differences and problems that have beset the country for many, many years. And finally, we have an arms control committee, which consists of representatives from the three committees I've mentioned, the uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, the Defence Select Committee, the International, De Defe uh, 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 International Development Select Committee, and the Trade 
or business select committee, which vets each and every license that the government seeks to issue to permit a UK arms manufacturer or dealer to export military uh, equipment abroad. And these instruments put limits on the freedom of action of governments. They hold both the government and our UK armed forces to account. And the very similar arrangements, not identical, but similar arrangements uh, in all other Western democracies. Indeed, if you or a country that wishes to join NATO, as so many former Warsaw Pact countries, former communist countries in Central and Eastern Europe have chosen to do, before you join, you have to demonstrate that you have civilian control of the armed forces. You have the checks and balances which we regard as essential in a Western democracy, uh, as well as having armed forces that would help rather than hinder the maintenance of security for people uh, in our countries. Now, I'd like you to have a look at table two in the chart. This is a top ten. I get rather fed up when we have list after list of the top ten films of all time and the top ten, etc., etc. But these are the top ten defence spenders last year in the world. Top of the list by a very long margin is the United States of America, who sen spend $600,000 million a year on defence. Number two is China. Number three is Russia. Number four, slightly oddly in this year, is Saudi Arabia, because in that particular year, last year, they bought a, a large number of uh, very costly um, military jet aircraft. Fourthly is the United Kingdom, and so on. You can read down the list. Um, last year, in fact, we came in third, pla in third place, higher than Russia, higher than Saudi Arabia. So you might say the UK, for a fairly small country, spends an enormous amount on defence. Surely we can keep our country, our citizens, our territory secure on our own. But I think we need to do so um, in partnership with other countries. Um, and I'd ask you to turn the page and look at table three. Our 57 billion, 57,000 million US dollars, that's about 30 something million billion pounds, um, buys us 170,000 service personnel. But if there was a major war, like the First World War or the Second World War, far, far, far more soldiers would be ranged against us. So, if you look at NATO as a whole, in the column on the right-hand side, NATO has, when we pool our resources, not 170,000 military personnel, but three and a half million. If you look at the number of tanks we have in the UK, it's just over 200. The number that NATO as an alliance has is over 13 now, we don't need all that many tanks because we think it's fairly unlikely that there'll be tank battles on UK soil. But some other NATO member states, closer to countries with large numbers of tanks, that's to say further east <laughs> than the UK, uh, still retain far more tanks than we do. We have 19 warships, surface ships. Um, one of the operations, successful operations, which NATO has recently conducted is in the Indian Ocean, off the Horn of Africa, uh, ensuring that pirates don't capture, rob, or ransom the crews of merchant ships. This matters to us because almost all the electronic kit we've got around here is made not in the UK, but in East Asia. Uh, and uh, it's shipped into us by ships. And if those ships are at risk of being pirated, then the cost of shipment is higher because the ships have to go longer uh, routes to seek to avoid known pirated areas, and insurance premia on those voyages uh, increased massively. Uh, so the cost of goods to us uh, was going up. Um, NATO, uh, through an operation called Ocean Shield, started deploying naval ships to patrol sea lanes around the Horn of Africa, as a result of which piracy 
has almost stopped to provide a threat to global shipping. NATO has done so with its own partners and also with other partners, including China, it might be said, um, uh, including Korea, it might be said, who took command of the operation for a period of time, although it's not a NATO uh, country. Um, had we sought to do that, to protect British shipping interests on our own, with 19 ships, we wouldn't have had enough ships to do it, partly because we need ships for some other things, partly because they're not all at sea at the same time, um, partly because when you capture pirates, you've got to abandon patrolling and take those pirates to land to some country where those people can be put in a court and tried for the international crime of piracy and so on. Uh, so we need partners to work with, and by working with our partners in NATO, we have a total fleet or a total strength of 280 ships. Uh, and the same, as you can see, with submarines, combat aircraft, which I use just as uh, illustrators. Uh, none of NATO's 28 countries, with the probable exception of the United States has the military capabilities on its own to conduct a significant security operation uh, alone. We were able to do so in Sierra Leone when faced uh, 10, 15 years ago with a small number of um, irregular bands of bandits fighting with small arms and light weapons, but in a major conflict we wouldn't have the resources to do so alone because the kit that armies fight with now are incredibly expensive, incredibly complex. For instance, in the mission um, uh, to prevent um, human casualties in Libya, uh, the Europeans who took the lead in flying uh, a no-fly zone uh, mission ran out of precision guided missiles within two weeks. The whole stock in Europe was used up. We had to call down stocks from the United States, buy them of course, but uh, there were greater stocks there. And even the United States wouldn't want to engage in a military action on its own because it would look isolated. It wants to show that it's part of a wider coalition. The United States finds it easier to explain what it's been doing in Afghanistan when it explains that there are 42 countries involved providing military personnel over the last um, 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 12 years to seek to stabilize uh, Afghanistan. So that includes the NATO 28, but almost as many other countries as well. Well, if our security depends not just on our own armed forces, but those of our allies too, we need mechanisms which hold to account the governments of other NATO countries, the armed forces of all NATO states, and chiefly that's done through the national parliaments of other countries, the Spanish holding the Spanish Minister of Defence to account, the French holding the French Minister of Defence to account, and so on. And our parliamentary assembly helps us swap notes. Sometimes we ask coordinated parliamentary questions so uh, that we get a picture of what's happening across the alliance uh, as a whole. Um, and sometimes there are assets or other policies of NATO which are held in common. For instance, the airborne radar aircraft which look over the horizon at potential threats, uh, an incoming military jet from a possibly hostile source, an incoming missile, uh, are not by and large owned by individual countries, but they're owned by NATO as a whole, and each country pays uh, a subscription. The UK has done something slightly different. It's bought its own aircraft, which it then contributes to the pool. Um, so we need ways to um, hold uh, um, uh, NATO and NATO assets to account. Now I get to the slightly difficult part of my argument. For many people, the idea that NATO is a force for peace I is counterintuitive. They've seen what NATO has done in Afghanistan and in other theatres, and they equate NATO with military force. So I'd like to go back to NATO's creation in 1949. It uh, was formed in response to the then Soviet Union's pressure on its Central and East European satellite states to abandon multi-party democracy and establish communist dictatorships. And there was a fear that Russia, 
if nothing was done, would keep nibbling. And having bitten off the opposition parties, the non-communist parties in uh, the Czech Republic and Hungary and elsewhere, it would then start doing the same uh, in Western Europe. Uh, the government at the time, the British government at the time, was a Labour government under Clement Attlee. Uh, and the British government was one of the key movers in the establishment of NATO. In a recent visit to Washington, I went to the national U.S. National Archivist and asked to see the original copy of the Washington Treaty, the thing that set up NATO. And you could see there, uh, signing on the line, Ernest Bevan, the then Labour Foreign Secretary, um, authorizing the creation uh, of NATO. Um, this happened at a time after, shortly after the Second World War, when a whole series of new international institutions were created to try to stop the carnage reflected in the first table that we talked about ever happening again to try and stop another world war. First of all, of course, was the creation of the United Nations, um, but also of the Bretton Woods institutions, that's to say the World Bank and the IMF, which were created to try to stop the hyperinflation that took place in Germany at the time that Hitler came to power. Um, the GATT, the forerunner of the World Trade Organization. And in many ways, the creation of NATO was part of a similar concept that one had to create institutions, international institutions, tools which would avoid global conflict. And when you look back at NATO's 65-year history, for the first 45 years, which was at a time when there was a deep ideological rift between East and West, which we don't have now, where the Soviet Union and its allies wanted to destroy capitalism because they thought it was inefficient, evil, and exploitative. And uh, we, in the liberal free market world, wanted to destroy the threat of communism, the dictatorship, the lack of plural democracy that it came with it. Um, and yet, during that first 40 years, the 40 years when NATO was fighting a Cold War, not a single shot was fired. So. Why is that? It's because NATO's primary mission is not to attack, but to defend. To defend the interest of its members against external threats. And NATO's first ever military engagement was in Bosnia in 1994. I was one of the MPs shortly after I was first elected to Parliament. I'd been to uh, Serbia and seen the catastrophic consequences of the fall of Yugoslavia and argued for a UK response at the time. In 1992 and 1993, our government was reluctant. Ministers would argue that the mm, Serbs are tough people, <sighs> it's mountainous terrain. During the Second World War, Serbia held down eight German divisions and sad though it was, there wasn't much that could be done. And I went with a cross-party group of MPs to uh, NATO to ask questions. Was there nothing that could be done? And we heard from most of the ambassadors and NATO officials exactly what John Major and his ministers were saying to us in London. And just before we were due to leave, um, we got a message from a man called Sir Richard Vincent, a field marshal in the days when Britain still had the field marshal. We don't have five-star generals now. Our top rank is a four-star general. That's because the army is smaller and we can't justify having five-star generals any longer. But he was the chairman of the military committee. They are the senior soldiers and other military personnel who advise NATO's political leaders, the ambassadors, on the military feasibility of different courses of action. And he said, I didn't know you were here. I've only just been told, but I'd like a word. Can you stay? So we said, of course we can stay. Uh, and he told us a very different story. He said, um, the longer, sooner or later, he said, you'll have to intervene because this genocide will get worse and worse. And the longer you leave it, the more battled hardened the Serbs and the Bosnian Serbs in particular will be and the harder it will be 
to defeat them. And then he told us a little story. He said as a young man, he'd been taken by his father to, uh, I think it was Croydon Aerodrome, but a historian in the room will correct me if I'm wrong, to see two miracles of a modern age. First of all, an aeroplane landing, and secondly, a prime minister getting out of that aeroplane. And it was when Chamberlain got out of the aeroplane with a little sheet of paper after his meeting with Hitler and said, it's peace in our time. And he told us it was called appeasement then and what the Western governments were doing, not just the British, what the whole of the West was doing, was appeasement now. And that sooner or later, we would have to follow a different policy. And this was the first occasion, eventually about a year later, when uh, NATO engaged uh, militarily under a UN mandate, it has to be said. So a few facts, if I may. Um, NATO is not just a military organization. It's a political military organization, and there's a difference. Um, it provides its member countries with a political forum. The ruling body of NATO is not made up of generals. It's made up of these ambassadors or ministers, um, the North Atlantic Council. And when they need technical military advice, they go to a subordinate committee, the military committee, which I've just described, uh, from the time it was... Um, chaired by a British general, um, who talk about what technically is possible. We asked Richard Vincent, well, what would you do in uh, uh, Bosnia? It's, we're told it's mountainous terrain. It would be terribly difficult for foreign soldiers to fight. What would you do? He said, one thing I would do would be to bomb not the power stations, because Serbs need the power, but the water supply to the power stations, which cool the generators. That would uh, switch off the power stations immediately, but you could restore the water supply relatively quickly and easily, perhaps in a couple of weeks. So at the end of a conflict, you could get the country back on a development path as quickly as possible. Now, I'm not, that's not actually what happened when we engaged in military action, but these people would propose military actions that might help to achieve the political objectives which NATO sets. A lot of what NATO does is political. We engage in political dialogue. Um, we provide advice on defense reforms um, to our newer members, to our older members actually too, uh, to countries which have no intention of joining NATO but want to become interoperable with NATO because they've worked with NATO on missions like the mission off the coast of Africa to clear the threat that pirates were posing to um, commercial shipping uh, in the uh, area. Um, and NATO doesn't want to be a substitute for the United Nations. The NATO treaty itself uh, respects the supremacy uh, of the United Nations Charter, and every single NATO operation that's ever been, with the exception of Kosovo in 1999, uh, have been conducted under a UN mandate. In the Kosovo case, the Russians provided a veto, you know, exercised a veto in the Security Council, and a decision was taken within NATO on the only occasion that's done this to go ahead without a UN mandate. Um, and NATO isn't a fig leaf of the United States of America. Uh, the rule is that every decision has to be made by consensus. That's a slow and minimalist decision. It takes just one country, Albania, for instance, to object, and an operation can't go ahead. So the United States cannot force its way or its decisions through NATO. So NATO's roles um, are about preserving peace and projecting peace. And they were reaffirmed uh, at the NATO summit in Wales in September this year, um, which I was invited to attend as the president of the parliamentary assembly. It was a great moment in my life. They sit in a circular table with um, 30 seats one for each nation, alphabetically, starting with Albania, ending up with the United States. Then comes the president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, then comes the Secretary General of NATO, so I ended up, this is my great moment sitting between Obama and the Secretary General of NATO. But it gave me an opportunity to explain to the heads of government, the heads of state, David Cameron, Obama, um, Francois Arvon from France, and so on, what it is that parliamentarians were saying about NATO and NATO's um, operations. Um, what did the 
NATO summit agree? Um, first of all, it emphasized the continuing importance of the transatlantic bond. That whatever our differences with the United States and Canada, we have more that holds us together than should be driving us apart. I've personally been doing a lot of work on this front. President Obama has been talking about a policy pivot towards Asia, away from Europe and towards Asia. Uh, they then abandoned the word pivot and they now use the word rebalancing. Uh, and I've been doing, uh, I talked to American colleagues who are members of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly and said, what can we do to stop you guys becoming ever more distant from your allies in Europe? Would you like me to come across and do a seminar for MPs, uh, you know, members of Congress and senators? And he said, well, what I think would happen is that nobody would turn up. But what we will organize, if you come across, is one-to-one -one meetings with the speaker of the House, with the chief whip, with the opposition chief whip, uh, and most important of all, with the key, I call them Eurosceptics, but it means something rather different to what it means over here, with the key American legislators who are opposed to a, a, a close security relationship with Europe. There have been uh, two votes in the US House of Representatives at the time I was first elected as president of the assembly, calling for the troops to be brought home, US troops based in Germany to be brought home. Now, I wish we had enough military muscle of our own in Europe to make us less dependent upon the United States, but we don't, and I don't see the appetite for us to double our defense spending in this country, and still less do I see an appetite from the Italians and uh, uh, the Spaniards and the Portuguese to double their uh, defense spending. There's quite an appetite to do it in Eastern Europe at the moment, and I'll say, if I may, a word or two about Russia uh, in just uh, a moment. Um, and so I started lobbying these with American colleagues on a one-to-one -one basis and different policies. You know, you, the, the, the same bring the troops home motion has been posed since then, but not a carrot. And perhaps a key person who made a difference was Paul Ryan, who was the vice presidential Republican who stood, uh, you know, who stood against Obama at the last presidential election. And he was persuaded, and there's a big hitter, a big cheese in the Congress, when he changed sides, he brought 30 or 40 Republicans with him who uh, changed tack um, as well. And the summit agreed a declaration on transatlantic solidarity. Uh, before it was um, put before the leaders, uh, the Secretary General of NATO had asked our Parliamentary Assembly to prepare a draft, which we did, uh, and which went a considerable way to shaping the final document. They committed themselves to greater transparency and accountability. For me, this was a big tick in the box which our assembly had been arguing for. They reaffirmed that NATO is not an exclusive club, um, that NATO doesn't go out and recruit new countries, but the door remains open. If any other European state says they want to join, then they have to go through a process. I talked earlier that you don't just join. You have to show you have democratic governance structures, that you have... Uh, usable armed forces and the four candidate members at the moment, uh, um, but the door remains open to them. It re-supported, it uh, restated its support for UN Security Council Resolution 1325, which is a resolution that uh, emphasizes the need to promote the role of women within defense structures, but also to protect women and children from violence in conflict areas. NATO's core missions are to preserve peace, first and foremost, in our own country, on our own territory. Uh, Article 5 of the NATO Treaty is this thing that gives the extraordinary mutual guarantee that attack, an attack against any one of our countries will be deemed an attack against all. Somebody fires a missile at Britain, everyone pools resources to respond. If somebody, perhaps more plausibly, was to cross the border into Estonia on the um, suggestion that Russian speakers in Estonia are being deprived of their rights by the Estonian government, Estonia is a member of NATO, Article 5 would be invoked. We would all have to respond to that threat. Um, and 
that is the primary, it remains the central purpose for NATO. But it also has roles, as I've just said, in projecting peace in crisis management, as for example uh, in Libya, uh, and in cooperative security, working with other countries, not NATO countries, to try to build understanding and cooperation, um, to exercise together, to share military resources together, to work together on joint political um, endeavors. We have a NATO, that's to say, has a Mediterranean dialogue with seven countries in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, six Arab countries and the State of Israel. It has something it calls the Istanbul Cooperation Initiative, which is uh, a similar partnership with a number of uh, Arab states in the Gulf area. And other partners, Switzerland and Sweden, neutral countries, but they work with and exercise with NATO. They put resources into not NATO's military operations, but its political affairs. Uh, Pakistan, Korea, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, some of our partners from Afghanistan. Um, we live in a changing world, and the NATO summit reflected that. During the first period of NATO's history, the Cold War period, um, the purpose was to deter and defend what was perceived as a Soviet threat, rightly, in my view, perceived as a Soviet threat. In the second chapter, after the Berlin Wall fell 25 years ago, NATO, in fact, the Parliamentary Assembly started doing this before NATO itself to put out a hand of, a hand of friendship to the former Warsaw Pact countries to help them adapt um, to democratize their political institutions, to liberalize their economies, um, to reform their armed forces. And we did this with Russia too. We invited the Russian Duma and the Federation Council, the two houses of the Russian Parliament, to join our assembly as associate members so they could see what they were doing to make sure there was no secret plan to undermine Russia's interest. And we put in quite a lot of, we, that's to say, governments in our countries put in a lot of aid to help Russia um, also uh, establish uh, more democratic institutions. Um, and the Russian invasion and annexation of Crimea early this year confirmed for me and uh, certainly for leaders of our countries too um, a realization that Russia has adopted a different and hostile foreign policy to its neighbors. Um, we'd seen this earlier in Moldova where there are still Russian troops uh, occupying part of Moldova um, under the pretext that there are as peacekeepers all over international resolution saying the peacekeepers should leave. Russian peacekeepers should leave. They, um, five years ago, engaged in a war with um, a Georgia, whatever the rights or wrongs of that conflict. I think Georgia was a bit provocative. They've nevertheless maintained occupying forces in Abkhazia and South Ossetia, two regions of Georgia, and show no intentions of leaving. Now they've nibbled off bits of um, Ukraine, both Crimea and in eastern Ukraine. And uh, President Putin has announced it enunciated a foreign policy that uh, reserves the right to intervene and to intervene militarily if necessary in uh, countries with Russian-speaking minorities. I suppose that could be Chelsea in the city of London, couldn't it? I think that's less likely, but there's a real fear, a genuine fear in the three Baltic states which all have a border with Russia, Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania, and in Poland which also has a border with Russia, the Russian um, enclave of Kaliningrad between Lithuania and Poland, where they have a military base, a large military base, of course. Um, and the summit had to um, determine how it was going to um, respond. We as an assembly had to determine how we were going to respond to Russian aggression. And we took the view that because a pattern of aggression was emerging, um, and because the two houses of the Russian parliament had voted specifically to endorse President Putin's military intervention in Ukraine, that we would withdraw their associate membership. They've been expelled from our assembly. We didn't think it right or reasonable that Russia should sit down as an associate member side by side with another of our associate members, Ukraine, and act as if it was business as usual and nothing had happened. Um, 
we, when we terminated our membership, said we're prepared to open some other form of dialogue, but membership of our assembly is over. Uh, at NATO itself, uh, Russia has an ambassador with the same status as the ambassador of any NATO state to act as a, as a point of communication uh, with a large team of diplomats working for him. Now, the ambassador, Alexander Grushko, remains, and dialogue remains at ambassadorial level, uh, but not below. Ambassadorial level or above, I should say. There's nothing to stop our Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, uh, talking to the Russian foreign minister. But again, it's not business as usual. The last thing I'd want to say is this. Uh, oh, uh, forgive me, two further things I want to say. Um, so NATO at the summit um, developed a number of military postures intended to deter further military aggression by Russia against states in uh, Eastern Europe. Um, we need to reduce our energy dependency um, on Russia. Um, uh, and Allied leaders also agreed the establishment of a readiness action plan, they called it, which um, very quickly deployed um, air and naval patrols to the Baltic to watch the increased Russian activity overflying um, NATO member countries. Um, we've decided to establish a continued military presence in the Eastern members of the alliance, which will be filled on a rotational basis with troops from NATO countries, to create uh, a very high readiness joint task force of 4,000 troops who will be ready to move at 48 hours notice in the event of further Russian aggression in Eastern Europe. We're pre-positioning heavy equipment in Eastern Europe so that if we do need to fly in large numbers of troops quickly, the equipment will be there already and the headquarters for this operation will be uh, in an East European country. And we're increasing the schedule of training exercises, which we can talk more about if you want. The point of this is not to provoke a war with Russia, it's to deter further military aggression from Russia, just the same way that a NATO posture during the Cold War deterred military aggression beyond the Warsaw Pact uh, area. But this all becomes meaningless <laughs> and fine words unless we will the financial means to pay for these um, initiatives. And at a time of austerity, I know it's difficult, but I don't believe that this is an issue that we conduct. NATO has long established two benchmarks that each country should spend 2% of its uh, gross national income on defense, and of that spending, 20% should go on equipment. Many countries still pay for large numbers of soldiers, but not for the modern military equipment that they need. In fact, only four NATO countries out of 28 meet the 2% target. The UK does, but only just. In the past uh, four years, why do I select that period? I leave it for you to <laughs> ponder. Our spending on defense has reduced from 2.5% uh, to just 2%. It's been a reduction of spending by about 18%. Um, I think we in Europe and NATO were wrong to ignore warning signals from Russia. Over the past five years, Russia has increased its defense spending by 10% each year, by more than 50% over a five-year period. Now, why was Russia wanting to have a stronger military force. Perhaps we now know, uh, looking at Ukraine. And at the same time, it wasn't just Britain cutting. I mean, across uh, NATO as a whole, uh, NATO members in Europe cut on average 2% a year. Or across Europe as a whole, 2% a year. It's defense spending over the past five years. So we were cutting and sending a signal to Russia that we were less willing to engage militarily, notwithstanding their build-up uh, of resources. I think I've probably gone on quite long enough. <laughs> um, I'm going to stop at this point, and through you, Chairman, I'm happy to um, engage in a conversation with the people in this room. <laughs>